the NFO Dairy Commodity Meeting at 1982 Louisville Convention. And the next one are going to be more or less training type meetings. We're going to have Ted McCarty will give you a brief explanation of what we can look for in the future. It's what he calls his doom and gloom type talk. Uh, it's things that you need to know so that we can do the things that are needed out here to correct the situation in dairy. Then Ted Strait will be up here and give you examples of answering the objection formula, answering the questions that you get out there in the field when you go down and talk to your neighbor. Too many times we get out there and we get one question and we don't know how to answer it, we turn around and go back home without ever really asking that individual to enroll in the National Farmers Organization. Right now, with the situation that we've got out here in agriculture, each and every one of us have got to go out in the country and do our part. That's the only way this job is going to get done. We can talk about lawsuits and everything else, but it's production out here in the country that talks. We're going to be showing you, by examples, how you can get that job done. Later on at the 4 o'clock meeting, we will even be giving examples of a particular county, how they have enrolled production in the last year, how they have teams that are going up and down the road almost daily, and it's paying off for them in their area. This time, I'm going to introduce Ted McCarty to give you his number one doom and gloom talk. It's not all doom and gloom, Al, but as Al said, the doom and gloom is the statistics, the facts and figures. There's something that we don't base a program on, but it's information we have to have in order to develop a program, because we cannot completely ignore the factual situation. So if it is doom and gloom, which it is to a degree, I promise you it'll be the last time you hear it in this meeting. So hey, statistics and projections and facts and figures are important to us and it's important to dairy farmers in developing our plans. Now projections can be changed. The National Farmers Organization has in the past change projections, as I'm sure most all of you realize. But milk production this year is estimated to be 135.3 billion pounds, an increase of 2.5 percent above last year. Now this could be more due to the current 50 cent assessment that went into effect December 1st, and the additional 50 cents that will most probably go into effect on April 1st. Last year, our total milk production in the United States was 134.3 billion pounds. Now, this 2.5 percent increase came about by increased production per cow as one factor. Now, as the average production per cow was 42 pounds higher this year than it was last year. And that's primarily due to cheaper concentrate prices. And from what I can hear throughout most parts of the country, we had better uh, forage this year, more protein, and we had better feed this year than we have had in prior years, better quality feed. Total cow numbers last year averaged, averaged 11 million head. That's 1% more 
than a year ago. <coughs> so you see, again, another factor to added production. Now, the bright side of the coin is that commercial usage this year is estimated to increase 2% or a total of 123.3 billion pounds. Now, that is going to be consumed primarily in the form of what we refer to as hard products, your cheeses, all your specialty cheeses, your dips, your yogurts, things of this nature. Class I sales, or what we normally refer bottled milk, have remained about flat, and we figure they're going to remain pretty flat again this year. They haven't been increasing. The increased consumption of dairy products has been coming around through the increased consumption of specialty items, new dairy items, and in particular, cheese. CCC purchases this year are estimated to be 13.9 billion pounds. That's an increase of only a little bit. It's only up slightly from the 13.7 that CCC purchased this year. And you see, we've almost got an offset between increased production and increased consumption. So it's forecasted by the government, and most of these are USDA statistics uh, that came out in their September Outlook Conference. So the difference uh, in increased production is pretty much absorbed by the forecasted increased consumption. The milk prices, the support price under the current law, which was also the law that had the assessment in it, was frozen at the same level that it has been since October 1st, 1980. <laughs> and that's $12.80 per hundredweight for a milk testing 3.5% butterfat. Now, you've got to watch this uh, support price figure because you get confused. Many people will talk $13.10 on support. Well, that is announced by USDA because that's at average fat contest throughout the United States, which is about 3.67. So we bring it down to 5%, down to 3.5, rather, so that we can relate it to the Minnesota-Wisconsin price series. And at 3.5% butter fat is $12.80. Now, the Minnesota-Wisconsin price series, which is established by selected plants in Minnesota and Wisconsin, it's important to all of us because it's the basic formula price for establishing milk under all federal orders throughout the United States. <coughs> So it's a factor we have to reckon with in talking about returns to dairy producers. The Minnesota-Wisconsin price series this year, on a simple average, was $12.47, down 10 cents from last year's average of $12.57. October of this year was the first month in 12 months that the series was above the same month a year ago. It was four cents higher in October of 1982 than in October of 1981. The series price in November remained at the same $12.56 level, again, four cents above the November 1981 level. So in 1981, October and November, the series price in both those months was $12.52, and this year it was $12.56 in both months. Uh, too coincidental? 
I believe so. Uh, we felt from what we saw on the field in Minnesota and Wisconsin that the series price should have risen five to seven cents this month. We're convinced that pay prices paid by manufacturing plants in those two states were that much higher. But the government statisticians didn't get that information. So we go on what the government publishes. Prices paid to producers were lower this year than last year due to two things, primarily. Number one, a lower series price, and number two, a lower blend price under the federal orders. Now, see, producers are paid on the base price or the blend price under their respective federal orders. Now, the lower blend price was caused by increased production and this increased production going in to what we call hard products again, butter, cheese, specialties, rather than fluid milk, your class, what we call class three items. <coughs> now your class three price is less than your class one price. So therefore it pulls the average price or the blend price down. So returns to producers were lower because of a lower blend price and a lower series price, which is the basing point. The first 50 cent assessment went into effect on December 1st. If the second 50 cents is deducted beginning April 1st, which is authorized to be, it is estimated that producers' prices will decline approximately 8% this coming year, due solely to the assessment. The other thing, if more milk is produced because of the assessment program, which we feel it will be, there's going to be more milk produced. Class one sales are not increasing. So therefore, it's going to be a higher percentage going into manufacturing use for products that are being consumed more rapidly and in greater quantities. And it will again have the effect of lowering the blend price. So the assessment becomes a steamroller. And they just bury us. They're going to take 8% out of our pocket. We're going to have to produce more milk, which is going to be consumed by the manufacturing market, which is going to lower our blend price and lower our returns much more. So that's the effect of it. Now, we've heard our U.S. Secretary of Agriculture on TV many, many times, describe the stockpile of dairy products that the U.S. has today. And he calls it outrageous. Holds up a block of moldy cheese. It's not even under the support program. That's something the government bought to give away and let go rotten themselves. They don't buy processed cheese. But the holdings today of U.S. government stocks, we have 408 million pounds of butter in storage in the United States today. We have 636 million pounds of cheese. We have 1.1 billion pounds of nonfat dry milk. Now, the government forecast for the end of this marketing year 
which is September 30th, 1983, is that they will have on hand at that time 554 million pounds of butter compared to 408 presently, 1 billion pounds of cheese compared to 636 presently, 1.5 billion pounds of nonfat dry milk powder compared to 1.1 billion currently. So you see what their forecast is for purchasing products. Mr. John Block, Secretary of Agriculture, defying congressional orders, defying provisions even of the Omnibus Reconciliation Act, which is our taxing act, has failed to sell these surplus products, or not surplus, really, they're not surplus, they're government stockpiles, which there was a demand for by foreign countries. And he has been instructed by Congress to sell these products at prevailing world market prices. The United States last year did not sell one pound of government stored dairy products. That's a crime. Despite offers to acquire U.S. dairy holdings at a value of $600 million to $800 million. That's what would have been returned to the U.S. Treasury. He refused to sell it. So now he's saying, Mr. Dairy Farmer, you are going to take $600 million out of your check, where he could have sold the government held stocks and recoup the same amount of money without any cost to the dairy farmer. But he didn't. He held it as hostage to get the assessment law passed, to lower support prices or do something that they wanted to do. And that's why he was talking about the huge stockpiles of dairy products. If he sold them, he couldn't brag about all this butter and cheese that were in government storage. And there were willing buyers. Now, the problem with that is that today, the situation has changed. Because of the world economy, the world market prices for the commodity credit stocks or the world market prices on butter, powder, and cheese have declined. So by the failure to sell, the U.S. Department of Agriculture did not put that money back into the U.S. Treasury and today would be unable to do it because of the prices that are available on the world market. The European common market nations, which are supplying most of the world market needs, are spending 30 to $40 billion annually in export subsidies of dairy products. 30 to $40 million dollars. The U.S. is spending approximately two billion dollars. I mean, that's 30 to 40 billion dollars, not million, I'm sorry. 30 to 40 billion dollars. The U.S. is spending approximately two billion dollars, and they call it outrageous. And that two billion dollars assumes that the stocks of Commodity Credit Corporation in inventory have a value of zero because that was their total 
expenditure for purchasing those products. They may have a value of zero if he sits on them and lets them rot and refuses to sell them. But they've got a value. They're in inventory, the same as you buy feed or fertilizer or gasoline or diesel fuel and put it in inventory. You've got an asset. So every one of you here, and we're going to make a concentrated effort on it, could con should contact your senators and congressmen in your areas because that's where we're going to have to get this thing straightened out. We will develop a plan. But it's going to have to be straightened out in the halls of Congress. And they should hear from the dairy industry what a Rube Goldberg plan this is. And that something else has to be done. As you heard Devon Woodland announce yesterday morning, the National Board of Directors has instructed their attorneys to file suit against the government contesting the constitutionality of the so-called milk tax. And that slid through Congress so fast, like one day, that nobody even knew it was there hardly. You couldn't keep track of it. It didn't come out of either chamber of the legislature in that form. It was devised in a conference committee of agriculture in a day and a half session. And they didn't call it the dairy bill. They called it the Omnibus Reconciliation Act of 1982. Who would know that had anything to do with farming? <laughs> All right, under the present law, Mr. John Block, U.S. Department, USDA Secretary of Agriculture, is authorized. I want to emphasize that word authorized. Is authorized to deduct 50 cents per hundred weight on all milk effective December 1st, 1982. It was 1981. He was authorized to do it. He determined to do it the 1st of December. But the key word is authorized. Congress did not mandate the assessment. They only authorized the secretary to make the assessment. Now, the act provides for a second 50 cents per hundredweight deduction on April 1, 1983, if two things happen. Well, if one thing happens, number one, the government must estimate that they're going to purchase at least 7.5 billion pounds milk equivalent during this marketing year. You heard earlier in my forecast that the USDA has put out that they're going to purchase 13.9, so there's no problem with him meeting that criteria. The only two rest other restrictions they put on Mr. Block or the only other restriction is that the 50 cents he must provide for refunds to producers who reduce their production in a prescribed amount in comparison to historic level production. That's fancy words, but that's what they use. What it means is a base plan, and they're going to take your historical base for your base, your production from last year, and that will be your base. And if you reduce by the determined percentage that production, the 50 cents will be refunded. This percentage we estimate to be 9%. Now, presently, the Federal Milk Market Order Program is handling the first 50 cents. We believe the second 50 cents, even though we've seen no rules or regulations, will be administered by the AFCS offices. That's where it looks like now. <coughs> and it's not going to be that you cut your production and wait for your check. I'll tell you that. It's not going to be that easy to get your money back. Uh, 
you're going to have to go into the ASCS office and prove to them that you cut your marketings. And they will give you, at that point, if you prove it to them, what they call an advance, okay? So you can't go in the first quarter and cut your production by 9% and collect some money and then produce more the second, third, and fourth quarter because they're going to come back and take what they gave you the first quarter because they call it an advance refund. So your total marketing for the year has to be down by 9% before you can get one penny refund. Now, they give you the advances, and your total for the year is not 9% less than the prior year. They're going to come back and say, hey, we gave you too much money. You've got to give it back, Charlie. So that's the way it, we anticipate it's going to work. We don't know at this point where we're going to file the lawsuit, the grounds we're going to bring it on. We're not going to try the case in the media anyway, but it will be filed very shortly. The first 50 cents dairy farmers will see removed from their milk checks when they get their check the 3rd of January, your advance check for December milk. There will be a 50 cent deduct on the first 15 days production. Now, if we're successful in the lawsuit, of course, we're asking for the return of all the money. And we still believe that the U.S. government, who has the authority to tax, and we see that they've overextended themselves here, can never go broke. So we're not worried about paying our money into them and then having the court say you've got to pay it back, we're, we're assured that the money will be there. So as I said earlier, we cannot ignore statistics and projections, but it does not mean that we can't do things to change them or overcome them. The NFO has changed projections in the past, and this year we will do the same. Thank you. The next portion of our program will be conducted by Ted Strait, and he is going to go through the objection formula and show you how to answer the questions that you might uh, receive out here or you might get from your neighbors out here in the field. So at this time, I want to introduce Ted Strait. I ain't going to do it. I'm sick and tired of carrying all this crap for you. Do it yourself. I guess what Ted is really wanting to know is what security he has that he'll have a job tomorrow morning. Ted, please. See, in answering objection, you uh, first want to explain the benefits of the product, and Al done a pretty good job explaining job security to me right there, didn't he? What we're going to do is show you a segment of the training station that your staff goes through. And the segment we're going to be dealing with today is on the objection formula or how to properly answer the questions that your neighbors may have. Now, the biggest thing that we do, and I used to do it myself and absolutely love it, I couldn't wait to get over there and get in a good argument with my neighbor. But when you're arguing with him or anybody else, you've got to remember one thing. They're not listening to you. They're just sitting there while you're talking, planning their attack to be able to come back and answer you with, aren't they? So they're not really listening. And what we've got to do to be able to do that is to turn on their receiver. Get them to want to listen, and then you can communicate with them. And this is the art of how we go through it. Now, the big thing that you've got to remember about any objection that your neighbor hits you with or anybody else does is that it is a definite buying signal. The man would not object to it or question it or ask a question about it if he wasn't interested in that certain subject, would he? So you've got to remember that. And I realize it's pretty hard to believe that when a guy's poking a pitchfork at you, he'd run you down the driveway that he really wants to join the National Farmers Organization, but he does. You gotta remember that, it's a definite buying sign. <laughs> <That's wrong. laughs> okay, there are certain points that we use in handling the objection. The first time you hear any question or objection, the first thing you do is completely ignore it. 
Now, he used a lot of good common sense and acknowledged the man that he spoke, but ignore the objection because it could be it's not important. Don't ever assume that the man is really hung up on this one issue. He might walk, he might walk in and he might tell you, hey, I'm on the board of directors of your local co-op down here. Good. And then go on with your talk. He just wanted to let you know. That's fine. It's not an objection. Don't worry about it. He says, what's your pay price? You tell him. He says, well, it's 10 cents less than mine. I know. And go on. It might not be that big issue to him. Don't get in a big detailed situation about it. If he does hit you with something, you can use what we call the feel, felt, and found method. Don't get all sorts of distorted little pictures in your mind when I say that. It's what, it's what we call the feel, felt, and found. A man hits you with something, you know, uh, for example, you the guys who used to uh, dump milk and shoot cows and everything else, you know. Well, I understand how you feel. A lot of people have felt the same way until they found the changes that the National Farmers Organization had made. It's a very easy way to lead into it no problem. And if it doesn't come up again, it wasn't an important objection to begin with. But if it does, and they will once in a while, if he brings it up again, then you must move on to step two, which we call hear him out. You must sit there and let him speak and listen to him very intently on what he is saying. You want to understand exactly what he's saying so you can answer it later. Now, there are two mechanics we call that we use in this that you must do. When a man is sitting there talking to you, you either encourage him or discourage him. When a guy's sitting there and ranting and raving and shaking a pitchfork in your face, telling you how you used to dump milk and everything else like this, remain absolutely still and stare him right in the eyes. Don't move. People don't like that at all. They like to be agreed with. And when he starts talking around to the positive a little bit and saying, well, of course, I can understand something needed to be done. We needed recognition and this type of thing. Start shaking your head, advance forward, and encourage him. People like to be agreed with, and when they find that you're ta he's talking on your side, he'll talk himself right back around the corner into the positive and the job's halfway done for you right then. The main thing that I caution you on, though, is if you go down the road, and the staff has experienced this, and I've caught him doing it, and I've done it myself, that I've heard this same objection in a certain area, the same one, 14 times that day. And I walk into this man's place, and I introduce myself, and I tell him who I'm with, and he hits me with his objection, and he starts talking. And what am I doing? I'm sitting there going, yep, yeah, I've heard this 16 times today. And what am I doing? I'm encouraging him to chew me out. Exactly. So be awful careful in doing that. Once you have heard him out, and he has talked it, and told you what his problem is, this is when you must question it. In other words, what you do is you ask the question back to him the way that you understood it to be. You definitely, it's common courtesy, you definitely want to know so you're talking on the same subject, don't you? And the perfect example I use on this all the time is when wife and I maybe have a little discussion about something or a good knockdown drag out argument. When we all get done after 35 minutes of arguing and discussing, we find out we were both right because we were talking about two different things, you see. So what you've got to do is qualify what statement that, you're, that he's wanting the answer to, 100%. And you do this simply by asking it back to him and then politely say, is that your question? And if it is, you go on to the next part of it, which is answering. If not, just simply say, well, what is it then? What did I miss? Because the man will appreciate that. Once you position it back to him in a positive way, he appreciates it because you understood him and people like to be understood, don't they? And it could be the simple one of, uh, what's your pay price? Uh, $12.95. Well, I'm getting $13.05 down here. Why in the world do you expect me to go with you? You position it back to him and say, well, sir, then what you're wanting to know is what additional benefits you'll receive that will offset that small variance in pay price, isn't it? Well, yeah, you got something that makes it worth that. See, people like that. They don't mind investing a little money in something if they're going to get something for it. I don't mind going out and paying $12 for a real good steak that's this big around and that thick and you can cut it with a butter knife and it flavors tremendous. I detest paying $5 for a tough piece of leather I can't chew. Don't you? And to me, the National Farmers Organization is worth every bit of that. Then, once you qualify, and this is a question you must hear, you go to the answer. You must answer it now. And in the answer part of the objection formula, there's four things you must remember. Number one, it must be brief. It must be brief. By keeping it brief, it takes all the importance off of it. If you give him a long, lengthy uh, dissertation on this and a big, long explanation, 
he's going to sit there and think, boy, this is really a problem with the National Farmers Organization, isn't it? So it must be brief. Also, you include a success story, and a success story is nothing more than a matter of fact that has already happened. And it adds a lot of validity to your statements. It's just a, a fact of matter that has already happened. You also include a nail down with it, and a nail down is simply nothing more than extracting a yes answer out of the man. And it can be, you deserve the opportunity to increase the income of your operation, don't you? When you say, don't you, like this, he's going to say, well, yes. You get a yes response out of it. Then the final thing that you must do in the answer part of the objection formula is what we call latch the door. And you simply do this by being very polite, and it's common courtesy again of saying, does that answer your question? Now, if it does, he's going to say yes. And we call it latching the door because it closes the door on that issue, and it'll never come up again. Now, failing to do this, failing to latch the door, is going to result in one thing. You're going to go on and talk about something else, and he's going to think you're still answering his original objection, and that way it results in not being brief, doesn't it? You see, so you must latch the door. It closes the issue on it. Then there's one more step after that. This is when you close the sale. This is when you ask the man to enroll and put his production on the truck or his coal cows in the block, everything. You ask for the close. There's a lot of people out here that you've talked to, your neighbors, up and down the road you've talked to a hundred times. And you say, how come that guy won't join? I can't understand it. He may have one objection. If, he, if you finally extract that objection out of him and you answer it, that could have been the only thing that ever held him from joining the National Farmers Organization. So what you do is you give him the opportunity to join right then and there. So you must close the sale. When you say, does that answer your question? He says, yes. And you close the sale by simply asking him, how does he spell his name and just endorse the agreements like that. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to give you some examples. I've got the area directors of training here that represent the nationwide program of the Dairy Division. We're going to give you some hypothetical situations up here of an objection, and they're going to go through the steps of the objection formula of positioning yourself back to me, answering the question, latching the door, and closing the sale. And hopefully what this will do is give you some ideas of how you can do it out there in the field. My first man is Mr. Steve Cutler, which represents the Midwest area, which is Wisconsin. Steve will be handling the objection on pay price. Now, pay price objections, we use these je objections come in different forms. You never know when they're going to come up. It can come in the price difference of the pay price difference. It can come in the uh, hauling rate too high. It can come as uh, checkoffs too high, whatever. But it's a money objection is what it is. What I will do is I'm going to give Steve the objection. Now, he's already been here talking to me, and this is when the objection comes up, and he will carry it on from there. Steve, what's your pay price? $12.90, Ted. $12.90? I'm getting $13 down here at my local co-op. How can you expect me to go with you? Well, Ted, if I understand what you're asking, you want to know what benefits we have in the National Farmers Organization that will offset any possible difference in pay price. Is that what you're asking, Ted? Well, yeah, if you've got something to give me for it, yeah. Well, Ted, uh, there are a lot of benefits to the National Farmers Organization, such as guaranteed checks, a national program that's bargaining in all commodities. We have professional staff bargaining for you, which are all important, aren't they? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But most important, by moving production through NFO, we can raise the M&W series. Now, the M&W series is basically just the average price being paid for grade B milk in the states of Minnesota and Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. But it sets the price for all milk. A and B throughout the nation. Anytime you move milk from the old system, which is the dairy industry, through our new system here, it takes away some of that uh, production they had. Now, the dairy industry wants to operate 100% efficiency, just like any, any business, such as your farm. Mm -hmm. When they're not operating at 100% efficiency, they want to replace that. And the only weapon they've got to replace that production is to raise their price. Mm -hmm. Now that forces the, the rest of the dairy industry to, to remain competitive. They have to raise their price also. I see. When that happens, naturally the average price or the M&W series goes up. Mm -hmm. And that raises the overall price of milk, which is really what we want, what we want isn't it, Ted? Oh, yeah. yeah. 
Now in Wisconsin, Ted, we started, we set ourselves some goals back in July. We wanted to put 20,000 pounds of milk per county per day on our trucks. Uh, we moved the first block in July. It was in Dane County, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. We've since moved blocks of milk in Green, Sauk, Iowa County, Monroe. We're in the process of burning now in the Chatech area. So you're doing this quite a bit all over, yeah. aren't you? Yeah. Uh, but the interesting thing is the M&W series, even now when, the, when there is supposed to be such a, quote, surplus, uh, the government stories, the government is buying so much production, the series went up two cents the first month. In other words, in August, mm -hmm. the series went up two cents. The following month, in September, the series went up two cents also. Mm -hmm. Now the Green Bay Cheese Exchange, for the first time in almost two years, went up two cents. And then in the month of uh, October, the series went up ten cents. And because of our moving this, this production, in July, when we first started doing this, our pay price was 12.67. Now yours was 12.77. Yeah. Now ours is 12.90, and yours is 13 dollars. But if your neighbors, such as Charlie Ellison down the road here, Irv Snyder, if they hadn't been part of this block and moved that production, you'd still be getting 12.77. I see. So they, you can see what the importance. Yes, sir. So you can see what the importance of moving the production through NFO is. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, does that answer your question, Ted? Yeah, it does. I see that. Uh, do you use a farm name, Ted, or do you? Uh, yeah, I do. What What is it? Utterly ridiculous. Utterly ridiculous. <laughs> How do you spell? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> what, what's your address here? Ted? Route three. Route three, Sauk City. Sauk City, yes. Sauk City. It's five three five eight three. Your uh, social security number? Four eight two six six zero zero two zero. Four eight. Uh, okay. How many cows milk, Ted? One hundred and thirty-five. Grade A. Right. Most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> we have some others like that. <laughs> you do have a good quality insurance program, don't you? Yes. Yeah. Ted, just, just okay that right by the exit. Okay. 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 What he done is he took all the importance off the 10 cent variance and showed me what I was going to get for that, didn't I? Didn't he? He also showed me the success of my neighbors being down the road coming on to force this block up, and I can do that much more joining with them. He showed growth. He gave a success story in there that actually it did happen. And these success stories that you're listening to, people, I want to guarantee you they are real. These aren't fabricated success stories. They're the real McCoys. All right, the second one we'll be dealing with is an objection on growth. How many of you have been to your neighbors and they come and tell you certain situations like, gosh, you'll never get enough people to get it all done or get 50 of my neighbors and then I'll go, this type of thing. It's dealing with a growth objection. Tony Bowles, which is the Mid-Atlantic area, area director of training, which includes Ohio, Indiana, Tennessee, Kentucky, and Michigan. Is that all of them, Tony? I believe so. And we'll be dealing with this one here on growth. Well, Tony, you're never going to get enough people to join the organization to get the job done. Ted, uh, if I understand you correctly, what you're wanting to know is, is if we've had any growth in the last couple of months in your area. Is that correct? Yeah. You putting anybody on? Yes, sir. Myself and Jay Pardon have been working the last couple of months in the surrounding counties, and uh, we wanted to contact the dairy farmers to see if they were interested in a program that would increase their profits, and we've had real good success. Um, Moore County, Tennessee. Uh, we had a meeting. They elected their officers for the first time in seven years. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've had a re good response from other counties. Uh, Jay Parton and myself enrolled nine members one week. It was the week before Thanksgiving. Nine members in these two counties. And since then, he has enrolled six more members. So uh, these members joined the NFO for one reason, and that's they felt it's time to unite their production so they can put a price tag on it. And for $75 a year, you can receive these same benefits and services. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Sounds like you're going pretty good. Yes, sir. Mr. Strait, uh, do you do business in farm name or personal name? Farm name, sir. Sure. Um, is that still utterly ridiculous? No, no, that was the other one. That was my neighbor down the road. This is, <laughs> this is hard times. Hard times. Hard times, farm. Uh, good. Um, this is Moore County, yes, state sir. of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. 
What's your social security number? 482-66-0020. Good. Your mailing address? Route 3. Uh, city? This is Lynchburg. Lynchburg, yes, it is. Tennessee, mm -hmm. zip code? Mm -hmm. 5841. Uh, your telephone number? 515-322-4057. Okay, Mr. Strait, just authorize this agreement right here. Okay.